The Magic and Atheist Mysticism by Dyer Contreras. 2021 Introduction, A Decade of Reflection. I initially composed a short collection of original poetry back in 2011 when I was 22 years old. Needless to say, I was very much a different person back then, although common wisdom may indicate otherwise, such as the old saying that goes, most individuals' personalities first form as teenagers and stay that way throughout life, but that was not the case for me. Although my overall personality did indeed first form as a teenager, it was in my late teens and early 20s that I was first diagnosed with schizophrenia, along with other serious illnesses, that dealt a major blow to my overall self-confidence at that time in my life. While most of the millennials at that point in time were busy working, attending college, dating, having sex on a regular basis, or all of the above, I, on the other hand, had become a recluse. Like I've said numerous times before to friends and family over the years, if it wasn't for my parents' willingness to take care of me at that point in time, I'd probably be dead right now. So, now to turn to the actual poetry. Having been raised Protestant and having attended a lot of private Protestant schools while growing up, when I first decided to, be, to come out of the atheist closet to my parents as a teenager, the overall backdrop is, that overall backdrop is crucial to the magic. Like I said before, my overall self-confidence at that point in time had been diminished. So, not surprisingly, if one reads between the lines of this collection, you can sense that I, as the author, am conflicted when it comes to the issue of religion, to say the least. In the present, I've made my choices, and, now, and I'm now 100% comfortable with being an agnostic atheist. Back then, though, I was just fresh off of having studied the Quran and the Rig Veda. Regarding the premise of this uh, collection of poetry, I completely disagree with that now in the present. I mean, science, if in terms of people's beliefs, if it's best represented by the atheist community, and then me trying to bridge the gap between that and the tradition of religious mysticism, no. I see no logical connection between the two. Having said that, though, right at the beginning of this collection of poetry, I actually uh, present two pieces that are not by myself, but by other people. The first one being a random quote from a now defunct uh, discussion forum, and the other one being a poem, original poem, by an individual named Rizwan on a Yahoo discussion forum that I found at that point in time, if my memory serves me right. <clears throat> at that time in my life, I had also just began to form my lifelong devotion to studying politics. Although I had technically started watching the news every day back in 2008, by the time 2011 had rolled around, I was much more fluent in the political banter that was going on every day. So I believe that in one poem, one can gather that U.S. President Barack Obama hadn't yet been reelected. Regret-filled poems and overall reflecting about my own failed relationships from my own failed friendships from high school also play a role in this collection, albeit those sort of poems constitute a minority. Setting aside the logical fallacies that colored my writing at the ripe old age of 22 and my general lack of conviction as a secular thinker that's evident in this collection of poetry, I must thank my friends from Fresno's atheist community for not only their friendship this past decade, but also for their very insightful, constructive criticism of my writings during that time as well. My friend Jennifer was the first to read this particular collection of poetry, and again, although I lacked confidence back then, and most especially after her critique of the magic, all that matters is the person that I matured into since those early days a decade ago. So having said all that, why exactly am I sharing this to YouTube? for both myself and my audience. I know that I'm currently not a perfect poet or writer, but then again, so is no one else. I just feel that in the very least, I should document my own evolution as an artist, and more importantly, as a person in general. When one looks back on the past, all you have are memories, after all. And so, the more accurate the memories, the better the remembering. A random quote from the Rational Valley Discussion Forum. For my own mental health, to put it in painfully prosaic terms, I find it extremely valuable to spend time contemplating what I have called the mystery of being. A practitioner of Zen might call it meditation. 
whether you call it space-time or the ground of being or existence or the holy transcendent God, I think it is undeniable that there is some underlying unity despite all the variation in the universe. There may be millions of light years between our eyes and many of the stars in the sky, but the continuity of the universe between them that allows all the phenomena that support and form the perception of a starry night is both awe-inspiring and beyond our knowledge and probably fundamentally beyond our ability to know it. Am I Too Intellectual to Be Happy? by Rizwan. Am I too intellectual to be happy? Note, I said intellectual, not smart. I know some fight might find this narcissistic and embarrassing, but I am genuinely curious about it. When I see pretty toys on a supermarket shelf, I used to think how fun and happy they made me feel. But now all I see are attractive pieces of packaging, dishonest promises, and a factory in some faraway exotic land where poor workers slave away making cheap toys all the while polluting the earth. When I go to church, just because my parents make me, and I know a lot about something religious, I always feel as if I'm the only one who knew and the only one who genuinely cared to answer. When I enter a big supermarket, I do not think of things to buy, but of how lucky I am to have so much abundance. I see tons of food in individual packaging, and I do not wonder about how they taste, but of how they got there. When I look upon the seemingly endless lines of aisles, I feel as if humanity is scraping off the last ounces of Earth's resources. It is almost painful to see such abundance. What will happen on the day when it's all gone? Our civilization will collapse. Every ounce of food seems infinitely precious. I see the trash on the roads. I see the tyrants. I see the ghettos and slums. I see the laborers who have sacrificed all happiness and freedom just to survive. I think of the wilderness that I have never walked and I feel I never will. I see the obese. I know all my dead relatives have died of either heart failure or heart attack. I see the hopeful child who wishes to change the world, and I think of how long and hard the road really is, how education never seems to end, and when it's finally over, you find yourself in an endless struggle for money and influence. I have only lived 14 years. When I see a person my age dating or when I see a married couple, I never seem to understand why. I think of how pointless it all is. Sometimes I wonder if there's ever true happiness in the world. Is there a place untouched by this chaotic, miserable world? No, I am not suicidal. I know how precious life is. I am not depressed as far as I know. I just want to know if someone feels the same way. Do I worry too much? Is there ever true happiness? Please tell me. As the sun sets. As the sun sets in the world for the final time, there will not be a single human to shed a single human tear over the end of humanity. The end is the beginning and the beginning is an end. For even though humanity will cease to exist, the planet Earth will not. It will continue to drift among the stars and be a distant light viewed by distant worlds. But will any immediate evidence of what caused humanity's destruction be preserved for any future travelers from across the cosmic sea who might stumble upon this planet one day? Maybe so, maybe not. But I know what will be be the cause of humanity's self-destruction. Fundamentalism. The belief that God will prevent the earth from turning into Venus, that God will reverse the effects of global warming, is self-delusion on a grand scale. For even if there is a God, it never has, and thus more than likely never will, intervene in the affairs of humans. So thus humanity, only you, can save yourself. In me. The world's getting worse every day. The stock market is down. The Middle East is on fire. Nobody likes Obama anymore, and here I am still the same. Should these outward changes produce inward changes in me? Fantasy. I want to go to a place that is like what? That is like where? Is this place called happiness? What is happiness? Morality. These words keep bubbling out of me. I don't know where they come from. From my moral fortitude? What is that anyway? What makes us want to do good? Oh, that's right. Natural selection. OCD and severe depression. How am I going to keep my sanity? How am I going to keep my sanity? The things I'm able to control, I'll control. And the things I'm not able to, there's nothing I can do about. Until when? In the meantime? Until what? 
I'm waiting. All the most terrifying and wonderful things in life. I'm going to keep it for you, my old lover, to whom I did the most unforgivable things. Not when or what, but why. I have to find out the truth, if the truth exists at all. Control. Our unconscious mind cannot control our conscious mind. Or is it the other way around? Was my first statement an example of me wanting to be in complete control of my life? How much can we control? See how the rattlesnake writhes. See how the rattlesnake writhes in a pool of scarlet into which it cannot dive, but yet it still continues to move in a twisting dance that does anything but soothe. Very soon the flies begin to come, quenching their thirst with the crimson rum. This they drank a safe distance from the clamping head of the serpent that was undone. From its majestic body long and wide, with scales tougher than the thickest hide, with its menacing face and hissing tongue, the insects were, were unsure if the snake angels had yet sung from above to carry its quarry home on a heavenly chariot with, with wings like unto a dove, to deliver it forever to snake God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. For so great a creature was this rattlesnake during life that at first I felt compelled to try and subdue it with a fife, like the snake charmers from India and abroad, as opposed to needlessly killing the serpent like the children sacrificed an ash dod. But yet I did, and I regret it. Actually, to be honest, I never kill a rattlesnake. On Plato. Plato's world of ideal forms. The perfect horse that is the template for all horses. What metaphysical nonsense. Eternity. Eternity is relentless. The eternity that exists within us all. What is eternity? the seemingly dull passing of time that ticks away our lives. But it shouldn't be, for time is fluid, ebbing and flowing, contracting and expanding. When time is slow is when we seem to notice it the most. But really, we notice it all the same, because the eternity that is within us is countered by the mortality within us. And the infinity within us is countered by the finity within us. This is because space and time are one. We are all walking in paradoxi. And what effects does this have on us? Discomfort. And why? because more often than not, human beings can't handle the truth. The closest thing to saying, I love you. The closest thing to saying, I love you, would be something like, thank you for allowing me to live out here in the beautiful country that is far away from the city, where although the people are both good and bad, they're still joyous to be around nonetheless, just as the joyousness of solid solitude is, being, is to be enjoyed as well. For this, I thank you. Thank you for giving me nutritious food to eat every day so that my body may be strengthened and renewed by it. For this, I thank you. Thank you for having brought so many things for me, such as music and books and art, that transported me all across the universe, allowing me to witness the thousands of brightly shining galaxies, brightly shining stars, and brightly shining planets, where thousands of other sentient beings like myself have lived, loved, got sick, and died. And did any of them become estranged from their parents? Yes. And why? Their reasons are as numerous and varied as there are stars in the sky. This is my reasons for not saying the one thing you yearn to hear are as numerous and varied as the stars in the sky. The one thing we all have in common, though, is our imperfection. Do I love my parents? My answer is, I don't know. And what are my reasons for that? Numerous and varied, or just plain psychosis? Even to that I say, I don't know. Perhaps I will one day, after some spiritual healing. So I guess the closest thing to saying I love you would just be, thanks for everything. Religion. You say knowledge of God is innate? I agree. That doesn't mean that there is a God. It's more likely that such knowledge is another product of our evolution, naturally selected to confer the greatest chance of survival, so that we may dupl duplicate our genes for at least another generation. Or you could just say, God did it. If I were. If I were to convert to Christianity, I'd become a very liberal Christian. If I were to convert to Islam, I'd become a Sufi. If I were to convert to Judaism, I'd become reform. But if I were to convert to either Buddhism or Hinduism, it wouldn't matter what kind I'd be, because even the most conservative version of those is more liberal than your average Abrahamic practitioner. All the problems in the world today are due to the Abrahamic religions. And all the solutions in the world today are in the hands of the Abrahamic religions. Essence. O oh, you, the essence of being, who is nameless, yet I name thee nonetheless. 
O you, essence of eternity, who is ineffable, yet I try to describe you nonetheless. Is there any way to eradicate the meme of theism forever and more from my vocabulary? Maybe there's a way. Maybe there's a way. I look up into the stars in the night sky and see upward all around me, both the essence of being and eternity. It's beautiful. So maybe I did. So maybe I did. Here. I sleep here. I eat here. I have sex here. I die here. Living. Don't let your life pass away without even living first. But what is living? That's for each of us to decide. The girls. The girls are walking around, talking around, gossiping around, letting their ponytails bounce and their ear rings jingle, being beautiful, being innocent, being naive, being young, being rash, being emotional, being in love, being in longing for the guy that they think will answer all of their problems. Even though more often than not, it's not as simple as that. Being flush of face, red-cheeked, being girls. People. People, people, people can have an influence on our life that is so strong that we barely even notice it. What's that all about? Why do we take for granted the things that matter the most to us? Shouldn't our loved ones make us think about the mysteries of life as well? Rumi once said that love is the astrolabe of God's mysteries. So then, where shall love lead us? To what place will love guide us? What decisions will love help us make? People, the people in our lives. Every, every morning I should untie the Gordian knot. And every night I should think of how to evade Tartarus. Every morning I should untie my shoelaces. And every night I should contemplate whether or not I will go to hell. Misery Index The inferno awaits you, the faithful tell me. Ha! I have refuted Pascal's wager. I seriously doubt the gospel's historical reliability, and now I, and I know that God does not exist. What lasting happiness do these things give me? None. That could be due to my schizophrenia and is not necessarily a reflection of atheism's supposed innate unhappiness. Or even if it is, I'll gladly trade some happiness for the truth. Hopefully one day in the future there will be enough atheists so that natural selection starts picking our belief system as a favorable trait for survival. Then we'll see who's happy. Always looking. Conservatives are always looking for some new conspiracy theory, and liberals are always looking for some new elegant idea. Is there any point in living this life? Is there any point in always waiting and always looking? It seems that life goes on and that this is too lonely. Will anything ever solve my existential angst? Will anything ever give me lasting happiness? Condemned. How does my happiness help me? It helps me stay on the straight path. It helps me see the error of my ways so that I'm continually self-improving into a more ethically perfect being every day. And what is my happiness? The joy of knowing that there's no man in the sky telling me how to live, that there is no endless torment that awaits me on the other side of the river Styx. I'm utterly and completely free. Free to live as I choose, even if I am condemned to be free, Saute. I'm condemned to be free. Condemned to be free. Never. Never again will I call certain people. Never again will I visit certain places. Never again will I reach out to certain people. Why? Because there's no point to it. They left me. They walked away from me or else I made things too awkward, or I embarrassed myself. I must always resist the urge to do these things. I must always resist the urge to reach out to certain people. But I must, and I will not do those things. I will never do those things again. A few people. Should these inward changes of mind be producing an outward change in the world? Yes, by all means it is possible, but only in the collective sense. For if there are enough enlightened people in this world, heaven on earth can become a reality. Science will be the medium, of course, but what about philosophy, the arts, music, etc.? I love those things. Just imagine an entire populace being able to understand Nietzsche and Voltaire. We will never stop going to church. We will never stop going to church. Only a fool says words like that. Only a fool wants organized socialization, although drinking skeptically would fall into this category. But who's to say that I'll always attend? Rumi once said, A little time alone in your room is more profitable to you than anything you can desire. And I agree. I'll do that, but then invite a few people into my room. The magic. The magic of the desert at night, the magic of the lit moon, the magic of the sand, of the coolness close to the ground. How many people died here? How many people have lived here? 
How many people have felt the presence of Allah in the desert? The magic of the desert, the magic of the Quran, is supposedly it being supposedly revealed from the angel Gabriel. Its pages take you in, mystify you, challenge you, transform you. It has all the answers. No questions allowed. The seduction of the darkness of the desert night. An owl flies overhead. Its shriek carries long. The magic of the desert. The magic of the desert. Third eye. The magic of holy text opens my third eye. Inwardly gazing, ever downwards, I see light. But what light? The light of evolution? The light of natural selection? Darwin would be proud of this realization. Squeegee your third eye, Bill Hicks said. I agree. I agree. What does the world really look like? What does the world really look like, Rene Descartes mused almost 400 years ago? What does it really look like without the aid of our imperfect eyes? Is it downright terrifying or beautiful beyond description? I don't know, and perhaps I never will. What does the world really look like? What does the world really look like? Third sight. The self hinders my third sight, but self-knowledge reveals it. My impression of Indian philosophy. The self is the source of all evil and thus responsible for all the pain and misery in the world. The self is full of conceit and lies. Nothing good will come from it. A life devoted to the pursuit of sensuous pleasures will not lead to the truth. Neither will life denying oneself of basic physical necessities. The truth will be reached only by a life devoted to the following and teaching of the wisdom resultant from achieving self-knowledge, which lies in the realization of the foolishness and yielding to the desires of the self. Self-abnegation, a denial of the self. The self is reflective of all our base instincts, our fears, suppressed desires, our thoughts throughout the course of our day-to-day -day existence. Yielding to the self, giving up oneself to one's own selfish desires and fears only results in more pain and suffering. Self-knowledge is not merely a conscious suppression of the self, like how most of us are able to suppress our inner desires and angers throughout the course of our daily existence, but unconsciously as well. It is through the realization of the very nature, the true state of the self, that all desires relinquish, and thus also our psychological bondage to the tyrannical slave driver that is the self. Know thyself. Self-knowledge produces true love, the capacity to truly love. Know thyself, Socrates is said to have uttered. Only when you know yourself, only when you truly understand yourself, can you only truly understand others. My old English teacher grimaces at my crude jokes. Does she understand herself? I doubt it. Do I understand myself? I doubt it. Then maybe we are on the same path. Whatever leads to the top of the mountain. Did the mountain come to Muhammad? What does that even mean? Bird song brings me comfort, Rumi once said. Know thyself, know thyself. Oh, Francisco, love me tender, love me sweet, so that together our souls may meet. With heavenly bliss, sealed with a perfect kiss, hopefully may I you never miss. Love and thankfulness. Is love another form of thankfulness, or is it vice versa? Oh, mystical poet, inform me of both love and thankfulness. And mystical scientists, tell me how the world really operates. Tell me how the spheres really rotate. Tell me what the world really looks like without the aid of our imperfect eyes. Love is thankfulness, and thankfulness is love. I thank. I thank the scientists of the world for the job that they do, crunching ton after ton of numbers, using logic extensively, which all brings them to conclude that the universe was created ex nihilo, chaotic inflation theory, something from nothing. I thank the scientists of the world for the job that they do, a job that no one else can do. Any better. In pagan symbols do I find comfort, for although I do not believe in them, in them I see the universal symbols of humanity that I cherish most, first and foremost the love and appreciation of knowledge, whether it be knowable or esoteric, and secondly a hidden mutual recognition of your neighbor's humanity. A wise man once said, the Quran is intended for two audiences, the audience of the 6th century and the audience of the future. The very same morality that justified killing the pagan also laid the seeds for future tolerance and social progress. Rumi once said, do not be chaste towards the idolater, for when he worships, he worships the same as you, because he doesn't know any better, just as you don't know any better. Baphomet. O oh, Baphomet, thou horrifying creature created by Alphonse Louis Constant, 
with your flaming torch ingrown between your two horns and your Hermes staff protruding from your loins. Take pity on me. Do not hurt me, molest me, or take me to another world that is horrifying beyond belief. What can I do but be in awe of your splendor? What can I do but be afraid with the fear of a thousand men? You are the supreme chimera. Poop. The monsters in the dark places. The things that go bump in the night. The unpredictable wind of quantum particles. Is anything for sure anymore? Is anything safe? Will the universe collapse on itself, destroying, destroying everything that ever was? Or will humans and other sentient beings be able to escape to another universe before it's too late? Worrisome anxiety. Poop. One day. Science is so complex I don't even understand it. And so I think that whatever is ununderstandable to me is more likely to be true. But what about learned religious rhetoric? Is my atheism really a matter of faith? No. What I can understand is what has led me to my atheism, but when it comes to what I currently can understand, I must simply throw up my hands. One day I'll figure it out. One day. A negation of the theme slash problem. Every time. Radiocarbon dating can tell us the true age of old holy books. Logic can help us deduce who wrote what, when, and why. Science can help us determine who lived in what city and when. Lo, do I praise science. Thank you for unshackling me from the chains of religion. Thank you for opening my third eye. Science versus the holy books. Science wins every time. Ancient Tomes The Lost Gospels of Mary Magdalene, Doubting Thomas, Peter, and Judas Iscariot. What do these ancient tomes tell me? What can I learn from them? The Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads. What do these ancient tomes tell me? What can I learn from them? The Tanakh, the New Testament, the Quran. What do these ancient tomes tell me? What can I learn from them? The mysteries of God. The mysteries of the Word of God. Or rather, the mysteries of men who thought they were speaking for God. That is what these ancient tomes tell me. That is what I can learn from them. Dionysus. All the most terrifying and wonderful things in life appear together in the same form. Dionysus, the true nature of truth. And when I do the act that I have to do, I'll remember all that preceded it. The things that I'm able to control, I'll control. And the things I'm not able to, there's nothing I can do about. I'm waiting. What is this? I need to shit, yet I do not need to shit. What is this? I need to sleep, yet I do not need to sleep. What is this? I need to eat, yet I do not need to eat. What is this? I feel pain, yet I do not feel pain. What is this? What is this pain? What is this shit stuck inside of me? What is this hunger? What is this insomnia stuck inside of me? I do not know. I do not know. Yet I should know. I should know. Dreams about Stephanie. Dreams about Stephanie make me wake up with mixed feelings of guilt and apprehension about the future, about the two choices that lay before me. Either I will talk to her again someday, or I will never talk to her again. At least one of these choices makes me doubt my ability to control myself. Who will marry Stephanie? Will it be me? I certainly hope not. Will it be Ryan? I certainly hope so. Dreams about Stephanie make me wake up with mixed feelings of guilt and apprehension about the future. Spending. It's a false argument when liberals say that America's defense spending is unsustainable. If Keynesian economics is true, then America can keep fighting wars indefinitely. But if Keynesian economics is false, not only must defense spending be cut, but also entitlements and tax cuts. That's why both parties are wrong when it comes to spending. Hopefully one day I'll figure out what to believe in regard to spending and the deficit. Spiders in the shower. Spiders in the shower. Spiders in the shower. There are so many spiders in the shower. I tried to kill one, but it propelled itself down, the fl down to the floor via a web, then tried to scurry away. I finally got it to stay on my fly swatter, then I threw it into the toilet and flushed it down. I repeated this four more times. Maybe only three more times. Who cares? There are so many goddamn spiders in the shower, but now they're all dead. Driving. Driving scares me. Driving terrifies me. Driving makes me nervous. Driving makes me doubt my ability to control myself. To control what? My physical pains and my schizophrenic hallucinations? Will I die in a car crash? I hope not. Maybe I should never learn to drive just to play it safe. But how safe is riding the bus? Damn it, if I only live in a socialist country where crime is less than in America. But I can't immigrate now. Not now. Driving scares me. The Rig Vita 
O Agni, Indra, Varuna, the Maruts, and Asvins, I laud all of thee, so that thy gracious blessings may fall upon me. O please, divine beings, give me plenty of kind, wealth, and nutritious food, so that I may conquer the unbelieving man in battle, so that I may vanquish the godless forevermore. O Agni, Indra, Varuna, the Maruts, and Asvins, may my plea be heard by thee. Visphadivas, may my prayer be heard. Life. Is it possible to dream a little peace of mind? Or is it just in my delusions I've come to find that you need to, too, find something to believe in or to hold on to? But when will we both realize? What is it that I want out of life? Is it possible to love? Or is there nothing but hate? The experiences we have in life determine our fate. Should I see the world or just live with my mom? Or maybe just kill myself while smoking a bong? Give me something, life. Enlightenment we yearn. I don't want to die forgotten but not be as notorious as Howard Stern. What is it that we want out of life? To condition our human hearts? That they be not filled with strife? We may never know, but all I know is this. To live our own truth and our destinies, may we not miss. Courageous Capitalism There's a movie coming out soon called Courageous. It's a cop movie about our boys in blue chasing down the bad guys. But what makes me wonder, though, is about the connection between crime and capitalism. In a society where there's no financial regulation... In a society where the robber barons control Wall Street, in a society where the market is like the Wild West, what message does that send to the average Joe like you and me? In a society that has more private colleges than public colleges, how will the masses become enlightened, especially the poverty-stricken masses? In a society where profit trumps social justice, why not turn to crime in order to survive? Capitalism needs a narrative, a never-ending epic story of struggle and deeds of heroism in order to survive. When will America realize this? When will America look to the rest of the industrialized world for guidance and stop living day to day like cowboys? Embrace socialism. Embrace social justice and the common good. Forsake capitalism. The one thing I don't like about the band Rush is they're liking Ayn Rand. Fuck Ayn Rand. Fuck capitalism. Government Mule. I don't want to live in a society where everyone suffers equally, Sean Hannity said. Well, you know what? I don't want to live in a society where one group of people suffers ten times worse than another group of people. That's laissez-faire capitalism. Some capitalism is a good thing, as they do in Western Europe. But complete and total capitalism? No thanks. Unrealistic philosophical idealism is why people support laissez-faire capitalism. And if not that, then just flat-out racism. African Americans should get a job and lift themselves out of poverty, some right-wingers say. What about slavery and the fact that the government never gave every freed slave 30 acres and a mule? You know, some capital they could use to invest with. This is the reason why so many African Americans are stuck in the ghetto. And what about their schools? Why do so many African Americans never graduate from high school? Shouldn't the public school system work? When it comes to this, I side with the right winger somewhat. An overpopulated public school just isn't going to cut it. What you need are charter schools, the middle ground between public schools and private schools. But who pays for them? Government funding. But ironically, the right wingers will cut this stuff because they don't believe in Keynesian economics. So you're creating poverty in America. So you are creating poverty in America, Mr. Boehner. You're creating crime in America, Rick Perry. Where's my government mule? Blood. Right before I fall asleep, I'm reminded of my mortality. The blood keeps pumping in my ear and I can hear it. When and how will I die? Perhaps it's something I'll never know. Perhaps something I'll know too much about. Why commit suicide? Because I don't want to grow old and become a burden on people. I want to be the master of my own fate. I don't want to die like some bird stuck in a cage. I don't want to be stuck in some old old folks home when I die. The blood keeps pumping. The blood keeps pumping. Slain. Indra slew virtra. Moses slew slavery. Buddha slew suffering. Jesus slew death. Muhammad slew polytheism. What am I going to slay? What are you going to slay? Does one actually need to slay anything? Or is mortal combat integral to life? Survival, survival of the fittest. Kill or be killed. Left-wing social engineering, right-wing social engineering, the Watchmen. Atlas shrugged. Which side will win? Will Obama be re-elected in 2012 and implement his left-wing social engineering? Maybe there's a middle row where nobody has to die. Compromise. What a beautiful thing. Religious slain. Ideological slain. Don't slay me, and I won't slay you. American Chess. The reason why socialism never caught on in America is because most Americans think that sooner or later... They'll all be millionaires, someone once said. American capitalism is about as frustrating as losing a game of chess. The pawns, African Americans, Latinos, and every and Asians, are sent out to die, but some of them make it to the end of the board and become royalty. Herman Cain comes to mind. 
The Knights, police officers, act in ways contrary to logic, like moving in an L and catch you when you least suspect it. The bishops, religious clergy, only can only act move in one way, narrow-mindedly. Some move on different squares, but they're all the same. The rooks, who lives in castles, rich people, can only act move in one way too, but their actions in the grand scheme of things resemble a cross. Not surprising. The final two pieces, the king and the queen, they're royalty to rich people as well, but there's something different about them. The king represents wealthy men, and the queen represents wealthy women, both of whom are married to each other. The king is the most important piece in a still largely matriarchal society, but his movement's actions are limited. You know, it's pretty much just sleep, eat, work, and fuck. The queen, on the other hand, has all kinds of actions on a daily basis the mirror that mirror her emotions, perhaps reflective of her mood swings. But yet, in a still largely matriarchal society, she's the most important piece. Why? Simply because she can move any number of spaces in any direction. She's the most flexible person on the board. And I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not just talking about wealthy women now, I mean all women. When you, meet, when you need someone to be sad with you, she can be sad. When happy, she can be happy. Women, they truly are a mystery. But to get back to the wealthy analogy, I guess the one thing I don't like about wealthy women is that some of them are gold diggers. They started out as a pawn, but through their sure determination of herself and her loved ones, she became a queen. And when things don't work out between herself and her rich husband, that's it. Divorce and settlement time. Half of the estate. So in this sense, then, the queen is the most powerful person in a marriage due to her wealth-enhanced female bravado. And how does all this tie in with capitalism? It's because of what a chessboard is used for, to battle. And that's what capitalism is, an epic struggle. Winner take all, and every American is engaged in it, whether they like it or not. And as far as becoming a millionaire goes, here's the deal. Some pawns do become royalty, but only some. Most of the rich stay rich and most of the pawns die. I guess socialism would be more akin to the game I guess socialism would be more akin to the game of Go or Chinese checkers. Erotic Nightmares. Erotic Nightmares is the name of one Steve Vai song. That's going to be the name of this poem, too. Erotic Nightmares make me wake up doubting my ability to self-control. Self-control what? My schizophrenic hallucinations. Annette Schwartz had a dick in my dream. In my dream, it made me horny. She was leading me by the hand while I was thinking of this, and when we turned around a corner, she turned around and turned into a demonic witch. I got scared and turned, turned around and run away. But it was too late. I woke up. What the fuck is wrong with me? Similarities. Some Jews say the Holocaust is the justification for what they do to the Palestinians. Some Arabs say the Nakba is the justification for what they do to the Jews. Notice any similarities? Neither side has the right to settling. Neither side has the right to indiscriminately kill civilians. Neither side has the right to launch attacks on each other. When will Israel stop settling? When will Hamas stop firing rockets into the Negev? When will the Palestinians stop blowing themselves up in Jewish settlements? When will Israel stop carpet bombing the Gaza Strip? When will peace be given a chance? And if peace ever is attained, who will stop the Christians from destroying this planet in anticipation of the rapture? God damn the Abrahamic religions to hell. In the Tanakh, it says that Canaan belongs to Jews. In the Quran, it says the Holy Land belongs to Muslims. Notice any similarities? Compassionate Atheism Compassionate atheism, what a novel idea. How compassionate should I be to understand that theists have emotional reasons for believing, to understand that probably without religion the world will fall apart as it is now? Or should I go to the extreme and be so compassionate I'm willing to tolerate a theistic lover, show her the intellectual love of atheism? Hardly. Where will love lead me? And what kind of love am I talking about? The kind of love that gives you herpes or the kind of divine love that Rumi talked about? I don't know. Maybe they're one and the same. Two sides of the same coin, or maybe they're not. What do I know? I'm rambling now. I'm not in love, by the way. Normative economics. The only legitimate argument against socialism is to say that it simply doesn't mathematically work out, or that socialist nations can't sustain massive deficit spending over time and will eventually crumble. The reason why is because to simply say that America's unemployment rate is too high is an example of normative economics, or in other words, economic statements that can't be mathematically measured. Europe has high unemployment rates, and they all seem to be fine as of the moment. Another reason is that Obama's current economic policies are designed to make America as a nation crumble or become non-existent because that will be good for the rest of the world. When it comes to this, one must ask whether or not America crumbling would in fact be good for the rest of the world. Beauty When beauty rears its ugly head, I, I experience ambivalence. Of course I'm disgusted because we have nothing in common, but I'm attracted to her simply because she's beautiful. What am I to do? I must repress those feelings of attraction because inner beauty trumps outer beauty. Inner beauty is what lasts longer than outer beauty. So when beauty rears its ugly head, I must simply look the other way. 
middle ground. I'm looking for the middle ground, musically, politically, and religiously. I appreciate Art Tatum, but most of his improvising goes over my head. What about music that has simpler riffs over which a simpler, more focused, more melodic solo can take place? I'm almost a libertarian. I like to meet other people who are socially liberal and fiscally moderate. I'm an agnostic atheist. Due to where I live, I think the most irreligious girlfriend I'll be able to get would be a deist. Should I try a UU date fighter? Date finder? Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Oscar. Oscar the Grouch is one lying, farting, hobo machine gun, spurting off round after round of hard one street wisdom to all the crack cores and future insane asylum patients of Sesame Street, who also desperately wanted to take his place. I can't exactly remember what happened to Oscar, something like death by food poisoning. I think he had eaten some lettuce that had sat in a garbage can for a little too long. He was a good Muppet, just like Diogenes the Cynic. Insane idea. Tepesi plus turtle equals tripesi. Ragnarok plus you equals Michael Bolton. Tepesi versus turtle equals crack turtle shell. Ragnarok versus you equals Michael Bolton. The final poem. Poetry to soothe me, poetry to move me, art to love and art to hate. Will art be my salvation? Maybe so, maybe not. And that's my answer to everything. That's why I am the way I am, indecisive about everything, even including whether or not to go on living. It seems that life goes on for everyone, and that this is just too lonely. In Dragon Ball, that's how things are. Everybody doing their own thing, and life just goes on, seemingly without meaning. So, Dyer, that's why you should become a theist, so my, so my detractors might say. But I say this in retort. If the truth is that life is meaningless, then so be it. Won't the truth set me free? Isn't embracing the truth good enough in itself? Atheism or even agnosticism may not be the most emotionally comforting belief system to live, to live by, but if they're true, then what's the problem? I think the problem is human nature. We've been designed by evolution to be theists so as to give us hope. But even if theism does provide hope, is it false hope? I think so. It isn't based in reality as far as I can tell. And once again, if reality says that I should kill myself, then so be it. That will solve my emotional problems once and for all. Typing this poem was a bitch not just because of the subject matter, but especially because of the fact that my computer kept on instantaneously moving where I was typing at to another spot for no explicable reason. Fuck this computer and fuck Ayn Rand. The end. <laughs>